are painful periods normal? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, so I'm a fertility doctor, and I talk about your reproductive health every single day. Please go ahead and subscribe to the channel and share this video with people if you find it helpful. So let's talk about painful periods because this is a question that I ask people every single day and I'm always surprised because I'm the last stop. People have seen other doctors before they come to me and I'm always surprised how little we talk about pain, especially pain in women, and how little we actually know about the diseases that cause pain because women's health is understudied and underfunded. And so you're gonna hear some really crazy numbers as I go through some of these rates of certain diseases. So what is a normal period? Are your periods supposed to be painful? Well, yes and no. Your periods are often crampy or somewhat painful, and this is called dysmenorrhea, painful menses, painful period. Now, when you have a period, what is happening is that your uterus has received the signal by progesterone dropping that there's no pregnancy. And so it wants to shut off the endometrial lining or that inside tissue that it grew. And this is a combination of glands and blood and other things. And it does so by contracting. And your body sends out prostaglandins, which help and cause it to contract. And yes, these contractions can cause pain. So it is very common. And of course, over 60% of people will say that they have painful periods or crampy periods. You might take pain medication for them. You might use a heating pad, but they're not going to impact your activities of your daily life or your quality of living. When they do, when you say, I am not going to go to dinner with my friends. I'm going to miss the football game. I'm going to cancel these plans. That is a concerning sign to us. And so when we look at people who have period pain that is so severe that it impacts their, what we call, you know, daily life, activities of daily living, it is really impacting your quality of life. That occurs in five to 15% of women. That number is huge. If we think about it, a lot of people are suffering from period pain so severe that it is impacting their desire to be normal a week out of every month. That's crazy. So where is the line between what is a normal cramp and what is problematic? And this is what I use for patients. If it is impacting your life, if you would cancel something fun because of your period, that should be a warning sign that there might be something more going on. Certainly, these things can be hard to diagnose. That makes it even more difficult. But understanding what might be underlying can be helpful, especially in long-term management of your reproductive care. So what can cause dysmenorrhea or painful periods? One thing is endometriosis. Endometriosis is an inflammatory condition where essentially there are endometrial-like cells. This is the endometrium, the inside of the uterus, that cell type found outside the uterus. And your body senses that this is abnormal and attacks these cells because they're in the wrong spot. So even though they're your own body, there's an autoimmune component because your body views this as foreign. And then it cascades into this extreme inflammatory reaction that will progress over time, even from inflammation to scar. If you are an adolescent or a teenager and you have periods so painful that you don't go to school or you're canceling fun plans, there's over a 50% chance that you have endometriosis. So it is one of the top causes of real primary dysmenorrhea, meaning having painful periods almost from the offset or from a very early stage. Endometriosis can definitely progress to severely impact your fertility. We know that endometriosis is associated with a decrease in ovarian reserve or the number of eggs you have. It's associated with stage three and four disease, meaning that more severe, higher burden of disease is associated with much lower pregnancy rates unless you do IVF. And we know that people who have endometriosis have a really high association with other autoimmune diseases like thyroid disease and celiac disease. So this diagnosis can certainly impact you long-term. It definitely might impact what you choose to do, meaning do you want to try to suppress anything that stimulates estrogen? So endometrial cells grow in response to estrogen. 
That's what happens inside the uterus and they are suppressed with progesterone. So if we know somebody has endometriosis, we are often looking at, is there a way to give them progesterone? Is there a way to prevent ovulation that can potentially decrease the burden of the disease from going further? And that's why treatments like birth control pills or daily progestins can potentially improve pain because these lesions aren't being like stimulated by the estrogen and why we've hypothesized that long-term pill use has also been associated with potentially an improvement in fertility in certain patients because it might be helping control endometriosis for lack of a better word. The truth is a lot about endo we don't know. Not everybody responds to the same treatment. Surgery is the only way we have to diagnose it. So not everybody's going to sign up for surgery. Surgery has inherent risks. And even when we get to the infertility stage, I don't do surgery on everybody, but 50% of patients with unexplained infertility have endo. Endo in the general population, we usually say is about 10% of people, but probably that number is underdiagnosed because it's hard to diagnose. It's not like there's an easy blood test or an easy thing to do. Another thing which can cause pain, which is very common, are uterine fibroids. Fibroids, also known as myomas, are a ball essentially of cells that's the same cell type as the uterine muscle, but instead of being in this nice kind of smooth architecture around the uterus, they conglomerate into a small ball. Huge genetic component, Tons of women have fibroids on hysterectomy. If you go cut open the uterus, up to 70%. And they can cause heavy bleeding and increase contractility because they're in that muscle layer. Fibroids can get really big. They can also cause what we call bulk symptoms, meaning pressure inside your abdomen. You could look pregnant. Now, neither endo or fibroids are causing any irregularity to your period. So if your periods are irregular, that doesn't mean you don't have these, but you might have something else associated. So endo, painful periods, but really no association with the amount of bleeding or the regularity. Fibroids, regular periods, but heavy. So typically heavy periods, potentially interperiod spotting, depending on where the fibroid's located. So the fibroid can be on the outside of the uterus, what we call subserosal, the serosa covers the uterus. It can be in the muscle, and this is by far the most common, and that is called intramural or in the muscle. And it can be inside the uterine cavity, and that's called submucus. Now fibroids, we used to remove them a lot more often than we actually are now. Really, we think fibroids are the sole cause for infertility in about 2 to 3% of people, so much lower than other etiologies, but probably location and size make a big difference. We are now leaving in fibroids, even intramuscularly, that are bigger in the vast majority of people. Previously, we would remove anything that was 5 centimeters or more or anything that was submucous inside the cavity we still remove those inside the cavity because they impact implantation. But those that are intramural or in the muscular layer, we often don't because you have one uterus, the risk to scarring and then not being able to have a normal functional uterus, the latter risk to uterine rupture with birth and what we're trying to achieve does not always make that worth surgical removal. But certainly fertility is not everybody's source here. And so if you're looking and you have pain, fibroids are a top cause of a hysterectomy, just getting your whole uterus removed. Fibroids can be attempted to be treated. They respond different to estrogen and progesterone, not quite as easily understood as endometriosis. Although in a majority of people, progestin will suppress growth in some dimension. But we often are giving progestins or combined birth control pills to try to control the bleeding because heavy bleeding, needing blood transfusions, being anemic, that can severely impact your quality of life and we don't wanna underestimate how severe that bleeding can be for some people with fibroids. There's also other options that are not really what we're looking at if you're trying to get pregnant where you can embolize the fibroid or you can try to destroy it in another mechanism. So there's treatment options. Knowing you have fibroids, we can diagnose these with ultrasound and then even often on exam just by feel of the uterus, it feels bigger. And then there's adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is so much more poorly understood. Adenomyosis is more commonly thought of as a cause of secondary dysmenorrhea, meaning 
Your periods were fine when you were younger, but they've progressively gotten worse. Adenomyosis is the presence of those endometrial glands inside the muscle. So cells that should be the inside of the uterus, but they're inside the muscular component of the uterus. And so most of the time, we believe this is happening from uterine surgery or a pregnancy. Because in a pregnancy, the placenta is invading that layer, or in a surgery where you're cutting open the uterus, you're giving a pathway for those cells to get into that layer. And so it has been seen and can be present in people without known uterine surgery or without a prior birth, but that is much less likely. And what adeno causes is more of this diffuse, people will call your uterus foggy, it can be a little bit enlarged, you definitely have decrease in normal blood flow or vasculature, and sometimes you can see this on ultrasound or MRI are the best ways to diagnose adenomyosis. Adeno is very difficult. There's surgery can sometimes be done, but very often I have seen people with their uterus flayed open and it's just this diffuse infiltration. And so what are you removing? Certainly adenomyosis prevalence has been told to be between five and 65%. Those are hugely different numbers and largely depends on what you're looking. Are you just looking at uterus samples, at hysterectomy? Are you looking at samples of myometrial tissue from surgery? Like, how are you diagnosing this? Most of the time we're diagnosing with imaging, ultrasound or MRI. If you have infertility and a concern for adenomyosis, we often will then consider certain types of suppression with medications like Lupron, very similarly to what we should be doing for endometriosis. And a lot of people are needing IVF with embryo transfer in order to get that Lupron suppression in those environments. And similarly, adenomyosis also does not impact the regularity of your periods and sometimes can impact the heaviness of the bleed. But all of these are where you have pain but essentially it's not impacting the ovulatory process. So ovulation is still happening. Remember that ovulation occurs mid-cycle, that's that middle schmerz, the contractions you might feel as that ovarian cyst ruptures and lets the egg out. So ovarian sources of painful periods are usually not the case. The period is usually related to the contracting of the uterus. And so when we look at dysmenorrhea or painful periods, that's usually where we're looking. More rare causes can be definitely masses, cervical masses, cervical cancer, endometrial cancer potentially, although that's more likely to be painless and associated with abnormal bleeding. Cervical cancer, similarly, you might have pain with intercourse, but most more commonly is going to be bleeding after intercourse or just abnormal random bleeding. So those are diseases where the bleeding is the symptom much more than the pain. Now, ovarian torsion, where your ovary twists, ovarian cysts, those things are a lot harder to disertain. They often will have come and go pain and not typically as associated with regular pain on your periods. The last thing I will say is that if you have pain that impacts your quality of life, please find a doctor who will take you seriously. There's no universal answer. It's not that everybody should have surgery or everybody should have the birth control pill, but you should Find somebody who will work with you on what we think this is because a lot of these diseases will impact your future fertility. They might impact hormonal management, lifestyle choices, development of other diseases. And these are things you want to know for your quality of life. As always, you can ask questions in the comments and we'll happily answer. You can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, or you can listen to the As a Woman podcast. Thanks, friends.